conference, and then we get into uh, other things related to the stewardship campaign. Before you know it, it's Christmas, and so we'll be back to Abraham in January. So hold on. I know that seems like a long time from now, but uh, we'll at least this morning have the opportunity to look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 and begin the account, because Abraham gets a lot of attention in this portion of Scripture. In a lot of ways, he is a great example of faith, but at other times he's an example of faithlessness as well, both faithfulness and faithlessness. And so we will look at his uh, life together as is depicted for us here in Hebrews chapter 11. This morning I've entitled my message, A Forsaking Faith. And it's not that we are forsaking faith, but by that I mean a, a, a faith that is willing to forsake all to follow the Lord and his will and his plan for our lives. And so I want to ask you a question today in relationship to that concept. And the question is this. The question is, what have you forsaken for Christ? What have you, what have you left behind? What have you given up? What have you surrendered because of a sense that this is what God wants you to do in your life? I think the concept is probably foreign to a lot of American Christians. After all, we live in a land where we kind of have it all and expect to have it all and expect to have things our way. And perhaps even from our brand of Christianity, we have developed a mindset of Christianity is kind of this uh, fringe benefits type of thing where, wow, think of all the wonderful things we have as believers in Jesus Christ. And so those are wonderful things after all there's nothing wrong with being thankful that first of all god offers eternal life through jesus christ his son and that we look forward to someday being able to spend eternity with him I mean, that's the that's the best part of it all is having a personal relationship with christ and the wonderful benefits of of salvation and then we enjoy fellowship we get to be a part of the family of god and the larger corporate body of christ but even more specifically here the the family of god at first baptist and all the relationships that that brings and the fellowship and, and people caring about each other and loving each other and ministering to one another's needs those are wonderful fringe benefits and and of course we enjoy answered prayer and god doing things on our behalf according to his plan and his will and, and obviously he also offers us peace in the midst of the trials and difficulties of life and so there are wonderful things about the christian life that we ought to be thankful for that that we enjoy but i'm afraid that a lot of christians don't even think in terms of their response back to this god who's done so many amazing things for them perhaps their mindset is surely god doesn't expect too much from me in return i mean i'll take all i can get from him but I hope he doesn't expect too much for, from me in return. And yet Christ said in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 14, verse 33, he said, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple, cannot be my, my follower, a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, is someone who is willing to give up anything and everything according to the plan of God in his life. He's willing to surrender it. And Abraham's an example in the Old Testament of somebody who did just that, who was willing to give up all that he had known in Ur and then later in Haran and, and all of those circumstances of life that we enjoy when we're rooted in one spot that he gave up because God told him to because God spoke to him and showed him that that was his plan for his life. That demanded faith. I mean, forsaking demands faith, does it not? For you to give up something, for you to turn your back on something, for you to leave something behind, you wouldn't do that unless there was some sense that, that, that God wanted you to do this in the first place, but also in, in the very real sense that what you're giving up is nothing compared to what God promises. And that was the case of Abraham. His faith, he understood that God had called him, but also he understood that God promised him blessings in return for his obedience. And so as we consider what God would want us to forsake, it is a step of faith. It is a matter of faith for us, and it's always worthwhile to forsake all for God. It's always worthwhile to obey and do what he says. And so this morning we look at Abraham, this amazing example of that kind of faith. This amazing example of a forsaking kind of faith because God wants us to forsake all, to follow him. It's not just a uniquely Abraham thing. 
It's not just, oh, good, I'm glad God wanted that of him, not me, type of thing that we might tend to, to do. If Jesus said, you can't be my disciple unless you're willing to forsake all, set it all behind and follow me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it's not just an Old Testament thing. It's not just an Abraham thing. It's a, it's a thing for all of us. It's what God calls all of us to do, to live completely surrendered and yielded lives. And so this morning, I want to look at three traits of of a forsaking faith. If you and I are going to live in a manner that is willing to forsake all to follow the Lord, what, is that, what does that look like? And we see it in the life of Abraham as is depicted here in Hebrews eleven eight. Notice what our text says when it describes Abraham in this way. Hebrews eleven eight. it says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out and this is one of the most vivid statements in all the Bible about living by faith. He went out not knowing where he was going. That's faith. And so notice with me three traits of forsaking faith. The first one is that a forsaking faith is an, an immediate faith. It, it's, a, it's a faith that's willing to obey immediately. I want to just read to you. If you want to turn there, you're welcome to, or you can just listen as I read the text to you this morning. I want to read to you the account that's found in, in Hebrews chapter t- or Genesis chapter 12 in relationship to this to give us a little bit better idea of what exactly it was that God was requiring of Abraham. What was God telling Abraham to do? Genesis 12, 1 through 4 tells us the specifics of it when it says this. Now the Lord had said to Abram, for his name was changed to Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then verse 4, it says, So Abraham, or Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And so the requirement that God had specifically stated to him in this text in Genesis chapter 12 was that, I want you to leave everything. Notice how it was stated there. I want you to leave behind family. I want you to leave behind friends. I want you to leave behind everything. Nothing should keep you from doing my plan and my will for your life. But on top of that, God said to him, and as a result of that, I'm, a result of that, I'm going to bless you. This is the beginning of the revelation of the Abrahamic covenant that God gave to Abraham and his descendants that we'll get more details about in, in a later, later passage of Scripture in Genesis 15, but it at least is alluded to there in terms of God's blessing on Abraham. But the requirement was to leave. The requirement was to, to forsake. The, the requirement was to obey, and so Abraham did that. The requirement, but then notice, secondly, the response. Genesis 12, 4 puts it this way. It says, he departed he left it all behind. In our passage here in Hebrews eleven eight, 8, it says Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out. He left. He left it all behind. He simply obeyed. I think it's interesting that there's no mention in th- this passage of Scripture of Abraham praying about it. There's no mention of Abraham waiting There's no mention of Abraham giving God excuses, although he probably could have had a long list in terms of the relationships that would be left behind and the circumstances that would be left behind and perhaps the material possessions that had to be left behind in order to make this long journey. He didn't give God any of those kinds of excuses. He simply obeyed. He simply did what God asked him to do. John Phillips describes it in these terms when he says, quote, one moment Abraham was a pagan moon worshiper, Joshua 24, 2. No different from his fellow citizens of Ur. The next moment, he was a believing man with his back toward his old way of life and his face toward the promised land, end quote. You see, God stepped into Abraham's circumstances and God stepped into Abraham's life and says, this was what I have for you, and Abraham obeyed by faith. And really, the the same thing ought to be true of us. In a very real way, Ur represented the old life for Abraham. It represented the the life of pre-God, if you will. And when God called him out of that, he called him to a new life. And when Jesus Christ saved you, he called you out of an old life, and he called you into new life. 
He called you to a life of obedience. He called you to leave things behind. And yet a lot of Christians struggle with hanging on to the old life. Living as if they weren't saved, as if Christ had not changed their life. And yet God wants us to leave the old life behind. Maybe it's old habits, maybe it's ungodly influences, but things that are representative of our old life, he wants us to leave those behind. And so we must respond by faith with an immediate kind of faith. He wants us to do so immediately. You know, we taught our kids, and probably you use this phrase with your children, that slow obedience is no obedience, right? And the same is true in our Christian lives. It's not just good for kids, it's good for us as moms and dads and adults that, that when we know God wants us to do something, the last thing you should do is delay. When you sense that the Lord wants you to do something, the, the, what you ought to do is immediately take steps of obedience and take steps of faith. Years ago, Dr. George Sweeting wrote an, an account of something that he had experienced as a family, and it illustrates this point. The account is, is, was one of him visiting the Niagara Falls with his family. And it was kind of the end of winter and the beginning of spring. And actually, I've only been to Niagara Falls once, and it was during that time of the year where there are chunks of ice floating down the river and going over the falls, and there's this ginormous pillar of, of, of snow slashed ice that's accumulated over the course of the winter to, from the foam and from the spray uh, coming off of Niagara Falls. And so he describes that kind of a scene. But one of the things that was interesting is as he was watching all these chunks of ice coming over the falls as they were up above the Niagara Falls, he noticed that, that there were all kinds of seagulls. And the seagulls were actually landing on these pieces of ice because what was embedded in the pieces of ice were some frozen fish that died because of a severe winter. And so these seagulls were pecking at the chunks of ice and pulling out chunks of frozen fish. Sorry if that grosses you out, okay? That's the life of a seagull, I guess. And so he watched with particular interest of this one seagull that was just going to town and feasting on the remains of this frozen fish. And it had apparently been doing so for quite some time. And he noticed all how the other seagulls would go. They would go along and they'd start to get close to the falls and all of a sudden you'd see the seagull take off and depart from this chunk of ice and fly off into safety. Well, one particular seagull kept getting closer and closer and closer to Niagara Falls and at the very last second it spread its wings to fly only to discover that its feet had been frozen into the chunk of ice. And with all of its might and all of its ability, this seagull was flapping his wings as hard as it possibly could to try to lift that chunk of ice out of the water and not go over the precipice into what is Niagara Falls, to no avail. And that seagull met its demise at the base of Niagara Falls. You see, that seagull learned the hard way of, of the danger or the peril of not doing something immediately and the danger of delay when it perhaps could have earlier if it had not waited so long, taken off of that piece of ice and not had any kind of problem whatsoever. And I can't help but wonder if we as Christians don't fall into the same trap of the danger of delay where we have great intentions of following God by faith or we know the Lord wants us to do this or to obey in that way or to do something else for him and yet we think, you know, I, I just need some time to think about this. I need to, some time to pray about this. And in the, in the midst of our good intentions, we never do what God wants us to do because we delay instead of immediately obeying. Abraham obeyed. Abraham obeyed immediately. He forsook Ur of Chaldee and left for the land that God had promised to him. And he didn't fall prey to the danger of delay. And you'll notice not just the requirement and the response, but then notice thirdly, the, the reason for that is because God had called him. Again, look at, look at the text and how it's stated there in Hebrews eleven eight 8, when it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out. It's interesting, the way that that is, is put together in terms of the phrase in the original language is it's a, it's a passive participle that could literally be translated, when he was being called. So it's this, it's this ongoing process of God calling him 
and, and him sensing that and, and knowing that and, and how that changed Abraham's mindset. I, I, I think of it like this. Abraham immediately started packing. He started packing for Canaan because he knew that's where God wanted him and his mind was already, already on what the future held instead of what the present held and where he was currently. He wasn't focused on where he was currently. He was focused on following God. And where God wanted him to go, I like to think of it as a, a moving mindset. Have you ever moved as a family? Maybe it was just across the town or across the county or across the state, or maybe you've moved multiple states away. You know what it's like to have, the, have a moving mindset where you know you're going to move. Everything changes in terms of where you are and the temporary nature of your current residence that you're not, you're not going to stay here. And so instead of thinking in terms of, of improving maybe your home or, or fixing something up or, or focusing on that, you're always thinking about the next place, where you're headed next and your moving plans and your logistics and perhaps even in selling stuff and getting rid of it. And your, your mind is on the future, and I think about when God called us here five years ago and, and just the sense that the, all I was thinking about was Elyria and First Baptist Church and, and this ministry and, and where we would live and, and everything I was doing kind of currently where I was in Iowa. Just Not that I didn't fulfill those responsibilities, I did, but when, when I had a chance to think about the future, it was all out here. And that's the kind of mindset that Abraham had because God was in the process of calling him when he was being called. You see, a forsaking faith is one that has its mind set on one thing, doing God's will. That was the focus of Abraham. He was moving on. And really, that's the focus for all believers. Like the old song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I just want to do what God wants me to do. And so I have to ask you, and we need to ask ourselves this morning, what area in your life is there that is lacking an immediate obedience, an immediate faith? What is there in your life where you know you ought to be obeying and yet you have been delaying? Maybe it's about salvation. Maybe you've heard the gospel and, and been presented with the fact that we're sinners separated from a holy God for all eternity and that Christ died on the cross for your sins. And you've heard that, that you need to respond with repentance and faith and receive the free gift of eternal life that, that Christ alone can offer. And yet you've, you've put that off. Don't fall prey to the danger of delay. Trust Christ as your personal Savior. Or maybe you're a Christian that, that's done that, and yet the Bible very clearly says that the very first step of obedience for a Christian is to be baptized by immersion, following conversion, and, and that's the first step of obedience for a new believer, and yet you've never been baptized. Don't fall prey to, to the danger of delay. Do what God wants you to do and be baptized. Or maybe there's some other area. Maybe it's the area of witnessing. Maybe it's the area of giving. Maybe it's the area of, of reading your Bible or some other area of obedience where you know you ought to be doing something and you just keep putting it off. You see, a forsaking faith is a faith that is immediate, that says, no, this is what God wants me to do. I'm going to do it. By God's grace, I'm going to do it. That's the kind of faith that Abraham had. Don't fall prey to the danger of delay. Secondly, then, not only did he have an immediate faith, but he also had an inheritance-oriented faith. Notice the next phrase here in Hebrews chapter 11, when it says this, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. We have the promise of that in Genesis chapter 12. I read those verses to you from Genesis 12, 2 and 3, and that God promised him blessings for his obedience. And, and actually, even though I, I mentioned Canaan and the land was already mentioned, the, the, the actual uh, promise of the land didn't come to Genesis chapter 15. So at the point at which Abraham left, he didn't really know all the specifics. He didn't know all the details, as our text says, and we'll study in a minute here he didn't even know where he was going so we i keep referring to canaan and mentioning that and we need to understand that that at this point abraham didn't even know that okay and so god had given this him this promise of this this place and this inheritance without all the specific details he simply 
obeyed and anticipated the blessing of being, being obedient. And isn't it like that so much for us as believers? We don't know the end game, and we don't know what God's going to do, but we know he wants us to do it, he wants us to obey him. And we may not know the blessings exactly, but we know in general God says, obey and I'll bless. Obey and I'll provide. Obey and I'll supply. And that's the kind of obedience that, that, that Abraham personified for us as he understood God's promise. And then secondly, not only should we notice his promise, but, but our prospect as well, because it, it's personal for us as well. And that God promises us an inheritance, an eternal inheritance that we can look forward to as Christians. And, and he, he blesses us when we obey, but we look ahead to an inheritance in heaven. And, and like Abraham in the promised land, we know fairly little about the specifics of heaven. I know the Bible gives us some details, but really when you th start to think about heaven, we really understand and, and have very few of the details of what that looks like. And yet all of us are called to have a, a faith that is inheritance-oriented, that's, that's heavenly in terms of its focus. Or as Colossians 3 puts it, we're called to set our mind on things above and not on things on the earth and make that which is eternal our, our primary focus in life because we have an eternal inheritance. And part of that eternal inheritance is not just heaven, but part of that in eternal inheritance are the rewards that, that are given to the children of God for obedience and for faithfulness and for surrender and even for forsaking things for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of Christ himself. And so we're promised this inheritance. Maybe we ought to think about it like this. Think, think about it in terms of, of this type of thing. What if you had an extremely wealthy uncle? And your uncle was a businessman. And he told you and all of your cousins that he had an opportunity for you in his multi-million dollar business. And that your inheritance of his millions and millions of dollars was directly contingent upon your efforts and your effectiveness of serving with him and under him in his business. What would you say to a proposal like that? Because he, he, ge he gave to you the opportunity to do nothing and receive no inheritance. Or he gave to you the opportunity to do a great deal and to leave your current career and become one of his associates, perhaps even a vice president, and, and if you did well in it, then you would inherit millions of dollars. What if you had an uncle like that? What would you say to that uncle? Would you take him up on the offer? Would you jump into the opportunity with both feet or would you ignore it altogether? I'm guessing that probably most of us would say, let's do this, right? Here's my, the opportunity of a lifetime. You need to understand, gaining heaven has nothing to do with our efforts, okay? Gaining not, heaven has nothing to do with our efforts. It has nothing to do with our good works, but gaining eternal rewards has everything to do with our spirit-driven, grace-motivated efforts to serve him. And so for the child of God who lives by faith, their focus in terms of passion, in terms of a priority, ought to be on the eternal and, and, and serving not an uncle, but the creator of the universe. And the rewards he promises to those who will serve him faithfully and just as Abraham was motivated to obey by the prospect of an inheritance, believers today ought to, ought to serve God with everything they have looking forward to their eternal reward as a result of it. But you would think, by the way many Christians live their lives, that they have underestimated the net worth of God. I mean, just think in terms of our priorities. Just think in terms of our passions. Just think of, in terms of how much time the average believer wastes on the temporal and the trivial. And you'd wonder, do they really think God's God? Do they really think the prospect and the promise is that wonderful in heaven? Wonderful. 
Or have we underestimated the net worth of the God who owns the universe and calls us to serve him with an inheritance-oriented kind of faith? Are you living your life realizing that someday we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will be given rewards based upon our fervor and our faithfulness to Almighty God? That was the prospect for Abraham. He was inheritance-oriented. And a faith that leaves behind the stuff of this world is a faith that says, you know what, it's going to be a whole lot better in heaven than anything this world can offer. And it's inheritance-oriented. And then finally this morning, it was not just a faith that was immediate, it was not just a faith that was inheritance-oriented, but the kind of faith that's a forsaking faith is a faith that's incredible incredible of what it was that Abraham did by God's grace. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. I like to think of that in two different ways. Number one, I like to think of it in terms of his determination. He went out. We might overlook that. He went out. He left Ur of Chaldee. I mean, no small task. Abraham couldn't just catch the next bus to Canaan, okay, or buy a plane ticket or rent the rider van, or pay a moving service. He went out. This map gives you a little bit of an idea, and I like this map because it it superimposes over that day's topography and map, today's national borders, just to give you an idea of where Abraham was then and where the borders are drawn now in terms of where Uruk-Kaldi was in the southern portion of Iraq and Iran off to the right and Syria all these places that are in the news constantly today that's where Abraham was from of course he couldn't just make a beeline straight west because that's desert and so the trade routes would go to the north and then circle back down and that's exactly what he had to do and they settled for a time in Haran and then after his father died they they moved to, to Canaan but all along the way not really knowing where they were going where it was that God was taking them and so Genesis chapter 12 verse 5 even alludes to the fact that Abraham had become a fairly wealthy man. So think of it in those terms too. I mean, It talks about how he had servants. So think of it in terms of all of his livestock and his servants and this massive entourage of people and thousands of miles traveled primarily on foot, foot and each night setting up the tents and taking them back down. Ladies, you're willing to sign up for that one? And you think camping's bad, try it for a lifetime, right? And yet, the Bible says here, this incredible faith is determination. He went out. Living the Christian life requires the same kind of determination. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to do what he tells me to do. It requires the daily determination that you're going to forsake all for Christ every day. And faith that isn't determined to obey, no matter what the cost or the challenge, is not forsaking faith. Think about your own life right now and perhaps the challenges you're faced with or maybe the cost that you're paying in terms of living the Christian life and the potential consequences of that here and now. Are you determined in the midst of that to live for God by faith? Abraham was. Notice his determination, but then secondly and finally, notice then his destination. And we keep, like I said earlier, we keep talking in terms of Canaan, Canaan, Canaan. He was going to Canaan, right? Because we know the rest of the story. God didn't tell him that at first. God just told him, leave her of Chaldee. Just get out of town. Apparently gave him some kind of general direction to head, but he didn't know where he was going. His destination was unknown. He had no maps, no prior knowledge, no precise destination. As a matter of fact, even in Genesis, if you read on there in Genesis 12, 6 through 9, you find him kind of wandering around Canaan as if he's not exactly sure where he's supposed to land. Canaan isn't even specifically mentioned until he's actually in Haran, as you saw on the map there. Can you imagine living that way? Where are we going next? I don't know. Can you imagine, imagine his wife? Where are we going tomorrow, Abraham? Well, that way. You know, I... I, at times, can be a little OCD with with planning. Um, For instance, this last summer, I could show you a piece of paper that has on it, this isn't the piece of paper, um, that had our our vacation itinerary. Some of you are like that, aren't you? 
where you know this day we're going to be here, this day we're going to be there. Others, your idea of vacation is, I don't want an itinerary, right? That's a vacation. And yet, (laughs) some of your wives right now are looking at your husbands like, yeah, that's my vacation versus your vacation. I, I get it, okay. But he didn't have it all mapped out. He didn't have it all planned out. He didn't know where he was going, and this was the rest of his life, not knowing where you're going. You see, faith is not figuring out what the future holds and then obeying, because that's our tendency, is it not? Figure out, okay, I kind of have an idea of where this is heading. Okay, now I'll obey. Now I'll trust. Now I'll believe. Now I, I'll do what God wants me to do. It's not, faith is not figuring out what the future holds and then obeying. Faith is following the one who holds the future even if you don't know where he's going. Even if you have no idea where he's leading you. But you know he is. That's what faith is. And that's what Abraham exercised. Do you have that kind of faith? Are you willing to follow God in that manner? Not knowing where he's going. What if? What if God called you to be a missionary? God's doing that in Dana's life. A few months ago, she wasn't sure where, where God was leading her. Now she's beginning to get the details. What if God wanted you to do the very same thing? Forsake all, follow him, if necessary, across the planet. Would you do it? Would you have an Abraham-like faith? What if God is calling you to do something else? Would you follow him? What if God's calling you to take a step of obedience that will take you down a whole new path of life and you aren't even sure where he's headed, but you know you need to obey? That's forsaking faith. What if God's asking you to do something above and beyond or different than you've ever done before in terms of your obedience and response to his direction in your life? I mean, I think about it even in connection with the Greater Things Stewardship Campaign. And what if, what if God is calling you to give in a manner that you've never given before and you don't even know how in the world God's going to supply in order to make that possible? Would you have enough faith to trust him to do what you think he wants you to do? And then you could fill in the blank. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if God wants you to? You fill in the blank. Would you trust him? Would you obey him? Would you follow him? Would you forsake your plans and your hopes and your dreams and your whatever it is, forsake all to follow him? Because it's not just an Abraham thing. It's not just an Old Testament thing. It's a New Testament thing, and it's a Christian thing. Because Jesus himself said, you can't be my disciple unless you're willing to forsake all. Do you have that kind of faith today? A faith that is immediate. Okay, God wants me to do this. I'm, gonna, I'm going to do it now. Is there some area in your life that you've been delaying? Beware of the danger of delay. Don't be that seagull. Or do you have a kind of faith that is inheritance-oriented, where you are living your life because there's a way better prospect in heaven in terms of eternal reward? Or are you settling for what this world offers, temporal, and really the meaningless by comparison? Or are you living with such passion and priority that your focus is on that which is eternal? And do you have an incredible kind of faith? Okay, God, I may not know where you're going, but I'm willing to follow you there, and I'm willing to trust you. May we have that kind of faith. Let's pray. Lord God, we bow before you with grateful hearts, For the example of Abraham, we know that his faith will falter, and it does in our lives as well. But thank you for this initial text and how he followed you by faith and trusted you. And I pray today, Lord, that we would have that same.